Let's continue exploring the universe within art and the art within redstone. In this, our fourth episode of the Let's Learn Redstone full video series, we're going to be looking at the Observer. We'll also be going over signal extenders and signal shorteners near the end of the video. If you missed the last three episodes, we've gone over the basics of running dust, strong and weak power, all of the basic components and the basic mechanics that you will need to know, and then we finally started talking about some of the intermediate things, which are configurations or gates. You know, things such as T-flops, the RS latch, timers, and clocks. So with those four tools at your disposal, plus the signal shortener and extender that we will be going over in this video, you will have the six basic configurations of how to do any sort of custom redstone that you could possibly want to do. But we're going to launch this video off by talking about observers. So basically, observers observe things. Whenever they notice that the block in front of them that they are facing has changed, they will emit a one tick pulse signal. More specifically, they notice whenever a block state changes. So like whenever a block is placed or destroyed or something is interacted with. They will also notice other observers that are being activated. And because of this, you can use them to run redstone straight up or straight down in a one by one area. Observers will strongly power the block that is directly behind it when they activate, meaning that you can pull a signal out directly from underneath that block or from any of the adjacent places next to that block. Observers are easy to use, but difficult to master, mainly because they are super helpful for things such as double piston extenders. Since observers notice when things activate, you can use them to dictate the order of operations in your redstone machines. So in this example, the observer is looking at the bottom piston. So the observer will activate after the bottom piston has activated or deactivated. And since the observer always activates after the bottom piston activates or deactivates, whenever they extend, there's nothing for the observer to trigger, so nothing happens. But whenever they retract, the observer at the very end of the sequence will cause the top piston to pull in that top block one last time so that the block comes back to its original position. This makes observers extremely helpful when dictating the order that things will activate in. Or you can always just use it simply, like this observer looking at this torch will activate any time that torch changes. So anytime it turns off, it will activate, or anytime that it turns on, it will activate. So you can use this to have something activate when a certain part of your redstone contraption activates. Observers are also really useful in piston chains when you're trying to move blocks around in specific ways. So since this observer is being activated by the left piston and then it is activating the right piston, it means the right piston will always activate after the left piston. It is also possible to use observers in a way that will activate pistons when you place a block. That way you can make a cube builder where you just keep placing a block in the same location. However, you should always be careful when using observers to make sure that the observer is not being triggered by the same thing that it's triggering. You know, in this case, the observer is being triggered by that left piston, and it's also triggering that left piston. So it's causing an infinite loop because it's basically triggering itself to activate. So you have to be careful to not create loops when it comes to using observers. This was a common problem that I would run into when I was first learning my redstone. You know, because it's kind of hard to visualize exactly what's triggering the observer sometimes. However, you can do this intentionally, such as with Bedrock's Trident Killer. You know, the Trident Killer uses observers to infinitely push a trident around in a circle. And since observers don't activate until they notice something else activating, you know, it causes a really smooth circle of activations. And the number of stuff that observers can notice is very great. You know, I'm sure I left some out, so let me know if I did in the comments below. But, you know, observers can notice blocks being placed. They can also notice entities if they are looking at string. Whenever an entity walks in front of string, it will update the string, which the observer can notice. Observers cannot notice, however, shulkers being opened or normal chests being opened, which is very sad, honestly. But it can notice whenever a trap chest is being opened if that trap chest is being placed on top of a lamp or a dropper or a dispenser. Observers will also notice barrels opening and closing, which is super duper cool. Observers can also notice whenever something grows onto another block, such as grass or mycelium or the nether stuff, or even a change in a dirt pathway or top snow. As snow is falling and the top snow changes, the observer will notice. It will also notice a bell being rung or cauldrons or composters filling up or changing the level in any way. It will also notice pages in a book being turned if that book is placed on a lectern 
or it will notice when you turn an item in an item frame. It will activate each time you turn that item. It will notice fire going out or fire being set, as well as any change in oxidation, if you scrape the oxidation away, or as weather naturally oxidizes the copper block. It will also notice whenever one of the workstations activates or deactivates, so when the furnace turns on or when it turns off, or when a beehive is filled with honey, or when that honey is removed from the beehive. I believe it will also notice bees coming and going out of the beehive, but I'm not 100% sure on that, but it also notices amethyst changing growth stages or being harvested. So as the amethyst grows, or as it's harvested, it will activate the observer. Observers can also notice rails, but only if they change their orientation. And I do believe that you can change the orientation of rails using pistons and things like that for complex rail lines. Um, but observers can also notice drip leaves when they are sagging or when they fix themselves. And observers can also notice changes in walls. You know how walls will connect to the other half blocks? Any time that the wall changes because it's being connected to another half block of some kind, it will activate the observer. This can be a really fancy way to activate redstone, you know, because the, the observer is going to be partly hidden by the wall, and you know, normally you just connecting a wall somewhere, either with a piston or by hand, doesn't do anything, but you can use it to activate redstone. Observers will also notice a change in a daylight sensor's mode, or when a flower is placed in a flower pot. And I always feel like there's a way to remove the flower without breaking the pot, but I can never find it. But observers will also notice when you change the timing on a repeater, or when lightning strikes a lightning rod, when a campfire gets put out, or whenever the campfire gets lit. And like you may have just noticed, observers will also notice water flowing into the block in front of it, or when that water goes away. They will also notice when redstone ore gets activated by someone stepping on it, but in my experiments, it only seemed to happen the very first time. Even if I waited a long time and stepped on it again, the observer didn't seem to notice the change. They can also notice whenever a pumpkin gets sheared into a jack-o'-lantern, or whenever a hopper gets locked or unlocked by redstone. But they won't notice if the hopper is empty or full or moving items. But it will also notice whenever an anvil takes damage from being used, whenever crops are planted or harvested, or whenever they grow using bone meal, or just over time. Same way with bamboo and sugarcane and cactus, it will notice all of that stuff growing or being harvested. Observers can notice when doors or trap doors open and close. It can also notice when redstone turns on and off. This includes dust and repeaters, comparators, you know, droppers, dispensers, pistons, basically all redstone components. The observer can notice when it turns on and when it turns off. And of course, levers and buttons when they are turned on or turned off. You know, and observers can notice other observers activating. So if you place two observers facing each other, they will just ping forever. This is called an observer clock. And to be honest, the observer clock should be avoided. It's easy to use, but it causes way more problems than the other clocks do. But now that we covered observers, let's move on to signal shorteners and signal extenders, or how to turn a lever into a button. As the name implies, a signal shortener will shorten a redstone signal. So if it's powered by a lever that is a static on, the signal shortener will turn it into a pulse that turns on and then off. The most basic way to accomplish this is by using the comparators compare feature. So a repeater that is one dust away from the comparator will overpower the comparator, thus turning it off. And then you can always add repeaters and add delay to those repeaters if you need the pulse to be longer. The most common use for signal shorteners is on things such as RS latches. You know, anytime that you're using a redstone block or something that emits a static signal, you know, maybe you need it to be there, but you don't want it to just always be on. So you can use a signal shortener to just send a pulse anytime that it activates. You can also use observers to turn levers into buttons in a super easy way. Since observers can notice when redstone turns on or off, or it can also notice when lamps turn on or off, you know, you can easily change a lever into a button using an observer. You can also totally hide that the observer is there by placing the lever on a block that is next to a lamp, so that the lever is turning on and off the lamp, which is activating the observer. Or if lamps are too expensive, you can always use a dispenser or a dropper. It'll just kind of make a noise anytime you turn it on, but the observer will also notice when the dropper or dispenser turns off, so it will work the exact same way. And now we can move on to signal extenders. So sometimes, you know, when you press a button, you want it to last for just a little bit longer, especially for things such as doors. 
Luckily, placing two comparators next to each other, facing opposite directions, and then connecting it all with redstone dust will extend the signal duration. And if you want it to last even longer, you can simply place a solid block coming out of one of the comparators. The reason that this works is that you're creating a redstone loop using the comparators. But comparators don't refresh the signal strength. So if you have a strength of 15 going into a comparator, the first dust coming out of the comparator will also have a strength of 15. But as the power travels to the second dust away from the comparator, it will go down by one signal strength. So if you place a solid block coming out of one of the comparators, this essentially means that every time the redstone makes a full loop, it will only go down by one signal strength right here, which is two dust away from one of the comparators. It is kind of hard to visualize, but the redstone signal is actually traveling in a circle, not just activating the whole thing all at once. And so as the redstone signal travels in a circle, it goes down by one signal strength every time it passes two redstone dust. But you can extend it even further just by adding comparators. But at a certain point, extenders kind of turn into timers. You know, a timer really is just basically a longer extender or a programmable extender. And so at a certain point, if you need the signal to last a long time, you know, like 30 seconds or a minute or five minutes, you know, that's where timers come in. You know, we talked about this last episode, but depending on how many items you put in the hopper will extend the duration of the timer. Now, one problem with this hopper timer, especially with really, really long times, is if you have it on a single activation like this, if you don't wait for the items to move back to their original hopper, the timer won't activate for very long. And you can even use the RS latch as a sort of timer type thing. You know, you can have like an observer activating the on piston at a certain point in the machine, like when you press a button or when a certain thing in the machine happens. And then you can attach, you know, either redstone through repeaters or even another observer to another section of the machine that will end up turning the RS latch back off. You know, this will create a, you know, a timer, but more so a timer based on activations rather than time. You know, like when a certain part of the machine activates, it will turn on. And then when a certain other part of the machine activates, it will turn off. Or like in this example, the RS latch turning on is technically what triggers it to turn off after it goes through a series of events. You know, after it goes through the light and the observer and the repeaters. But you could always attach that to another part of the machine, you know, and, and this is kind of a funky example because it doesn't actually do anything. But I just wanted to show an example of how you can use an RS latch with observers to have it activate at different timings inside of your own machine. And now let's go over some examples of everything that we just talked about. So the most common use that I've found for signal extenders is with doors. You know, when you run a pressure plate or a button really far away from the door, you know, if you just use repeater delay to try to time it to where the player gets to the door in time, it can be kind of difficult. But if you use a signal extender using the comparators, it makes it much, much easier to actually make it through the door after pressing the button. And again, if you want it to last even longer, you could just add some more comparators. This can be really helpful for mini games and stuff like that. You know, give you X time to shoot a target before it turns back off. Now, as for the timer, I have used it to extend signals for really, really long times with like gambling machines and stuff like that. But the most common use that I find for a timer such as this is to control my minecarts on my farms. You know, you really, really do not want a forever minecart. Moving minecarts are extremely laggy and there's just no, you know, sense in it. But if you attach a minecart to a five minute timer and then have a signal shortener coming out of that to actually activate the minecart, it will activate once every five minutes, which will guarantee that it picks up all your items and cut down on lag. It can also be kind of fun to convert levers into buttons using signal shorteners. You know, just an observer looking at the lever attached to like a T-flop that we talked about last episode will allow you to toggle a door every time you flick a lever. And of course, you could attach multiple levers converting them into buttons to the dispenser so that it doesn't lock the dispenser like a normal lever would. Another funky thing you can do is you can attach a signal shortener to a T-flop. You know, normally a T-flop gives you a static on and then a static off the next time you press the input. But if you attach a signal shortener to it, now it basically just ignores every other activation. You know, it's still giving you an on every other time, but since that on doesn't last for but a pulse, you know, it, it's essentially skipping every other activation. 
This can just be an interesting mechanic to play around with in certain custom machines, you know, having the ability to skip every other activation. And then when it comes to observers, there's a bunch of fancy things you can do with them. You know, like we talked about this double piston extender earlier, you know, if you just have some slime coming off of these sticky pistons attached to some blocks, you can make a very easy hidden door just using this very simple piston extender. And this is a pretty good example of how you can use observers either in very simple ways to dictate, you know, when a certain part of the machine activates, I want a sound to play. You know, or you can use it for double piston extenders, triple piston extenders, you know, hidden doors, flying machines, all kinds of stuff. You know, or for this specific example, you can combine what we talked about last episode, you know, and add a T-flop to the activation of this piston door. That way, you can use a button instead of a lever in order to toggle the door open and closed. You know, you could also run multiple buttons to that same dispenser, of course, to toggle the T-flop from either side of the door, you know, or from anywhere else on the map. You could have hidden activations or just multiple ones. You know, here we have a T-flop that allows you to use a button instead of a lever going into a double piston extender, which acts as a hidden door. And double piston extenders can be really nice for certain custom redstone. You know, I've used them for harvesting sites, you know, for hidden chests, um, for, for, you know, funky bridge maker type things. You know, just, you know, being able to move blocks more than just a single tile, you know, is super, super duper nice. And observers really make this easier since they can trigger at certain times. You know, like in this case, we need an observer to trigger that, that rightmost piston one more time so that it will drag that block back in. And so simply just having that observer activate after the first piston activates and deactivates, you know, and then having it run to that block, when it extends, there's nothing there to activate, so it doesn't mess with anything. But when it retracts, at the very end, it causes that right piston to grab that block and pull it back into place. And you could accomplish the exact same thing without the observer, but it would be more complex. You know, trying to get repeaters to activate timings at certain times but not others, you know, can be way more difficult than simply using observers. You know, or like I mentioned, observers are responsible for flying machines. You know, because every time the flying machine moves, it triggers the observer to send a signal. And so the observer is activating the piston, which is causing it to move itself, which is then causing the observer to activate again. You know, and so this allows for flying machines just for fun, or flying machines that are part of a farm, like you see here, to use as a harvesting scythe. You know, observers really open up a whole new world. You know, they are very simple, but also very complex. But that's all we got for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like, favorite, share, and subscribe. And talk to me down in the comments. Let me know what you're doing in your own redstone journey. You know, what you're building in your world. Any questions that you may have or any requests that you would like me to talk about. You know, I'd be happy to help you out in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Just talk to me in the comments because it really, really helps out the video. Plus, I always love hearing what people are doing in this game. You know, I just love how there's so many different ways for you to accomplish the same types of things. You know, so I would love to hear what you're doing and what you're building. You can also check the video description for a link to my Discord. You know, you can join that Minecraft community to share pictures of your builds. I would love to see them. You know, to talk to me about Redstone, to find players to play with, or to find worlds to play in. You know, really anything Minecraft related that you would like to do, just join that community and talk to me there. And just in case you weren't aware, I have a series of Let's Learn Redstone shorts that cover each component individually. So every redstone component has its own short or own series of shorts explaining exactly what it does and how you use it. So if you're confused about a single mechanic or a single component, you know, simply search through my shorts and hopefully I can help you out. But that's all we got for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I've been your host, Omledu, hopefully teaching you a redstone trick or two. And reminding you, as always, don't forget to have fun. Bye-bye.